And welcome to the 39th virtual shadowing session. Tonight's session, we have a PA who will be, who will be discussing critical care and finance. All right, next slide. Okay, so here are some upcoming sessions during the month of March. We have a PA spotlight in family medicine and lifestyle. We have a specialty spotlight in plastic surgery. We have another specialty spotlight in pediatric internal medicine. And we have a specialty spotlight in orthopedic surgery. And lastly, we have a specialty spotlight in cardiology, which we have rescheduled for March 25th. Okay, next slide. Here's our virtual shadowing working group. We have Reagan, Cheyenne, Taylor, Rachel, Ani, Miriam, Rohit, myself, and we have Dr. Fowler, Dr. Marchetti, Dr. Salazar, and Dr. Reno. Okay, next slide. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to put it in the chat as we go along. We will have two Q&A sessions, one in the middle and one at the very end. And just a friendly reminder, if you have any questions regarding the quiz, uh, we will answer them at, towards the very end. All right, um, Dr. Fowler, do you have a few announcements? Absolutely, welcome to all 500 of you out there. It's so nice to have you here. This is for the 39th virtual shadowing program. As you know, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had to give way to the weather here. Uh, because we had a miserable time here in Texas, but it's all nice and warm. It was a gorgeous 70 degree clear day today. So we're getting ready for spring. Thank you for joining us. Um, virtual shadowing has been a wonderful program and obviously it seems to appeal to a lot of important elements. Uh, right before I signed on here, we've had over 46,000 of you that have joined us on the website. So welcome. It's so good to have you. And our uh, derivative program, our spinoff, the Virtual Clinical Observation Program, VCOP, <clears throat> is alive and well. You can get to it by vcop.ws. Would one of you, Elena, or one of you put that in the uh, chat, please? <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, vcop.ws lets you um, go to online uh, clinical observation, and it's a terrific program. We've already had a thousand of you sign up. Um, and just in three weeks, we're going to close it at 5,000. And so uh, please go to vcop, vcop.ws. And if you have interest, please sign up. So anyway, good to have you. And uh, Elena, you want to introduce our wonderful speaker for the evening? Yes. So Kristen, I'm sure um, we have over 500 students listening. So we are all very excited to hear what you have to say. So I will let you take it away. Thank you. Well, I am excited to be here uh, representing the PA profession and talking all about um, my job in pulmonary critical care and a little bit of personal finance at the end. Um, so the way it's kind of split up, the first section will be about kind of my current job and critical care and those things. And then we'll do a Q&A section and then talk a little bit about personal finance and do another Q&A at the end. All right, with that, we will dive in. Um, so this is me. I practice full-time in pulmonary critical care. I work in the Indianapolis area at a community hospital with about 500 beds, and I work full-time night shift. I've been on the board for um, my state PA organization here in Indiana, and I'm affiliate faculty at one of our local PA programs, actually um, the program I graduated from. And in addition, I'm founder of a company that promotes financial literacy and financial independence specifically to healthcare professionals. So we'll talk about that at the end of things. Um, just background information on me. I grew up in Brownsburg, Indiana, which is where I still live. I went to undergrad at Indiana Purdue University in Fort Wayne, and I went to PA school at Butler University in Indianapolis. This is my little family here. I'm married to my high school sweetheart, and we have this little adorable um, Shih Tzu Bichon puppy. And uh, yeah, that's us. So before I talk really about my job in particular, I want to talk a little bit about just being a PA in general. Um, you know, this looks a lot different for me and newer PAs and people that have been in practice for maybe 10 years or less than it did, you know, 15, 20, 30 years ago. 
So the kind of role of a PA has changed. The landscape of the profession and where it's going has substantially changed. And the reason sort of to become a PA may even be a little bit different now than they would have been a few decades ago. So one of the obvious benefits is that there's a shortened duration of training compared to a physician. Um, for most PAs, the current graduate school portion is about 27 months. My program was actually 36 months, but again, that was a few years ago and the transition lately has really been towards kind of a 27 month program. As a result of the training being less, the associated cost of training is less. So, you know, the average PA graduates with statistically less student loans than someone who graduates from medical school. The job outlook is excellent in general, which is why we were ranked to the number one job for 2021 uh, this year, which is exciting. And, you know, it's a good income. It's a good return on investment for the training involved. Probably my favorite part of the profession is the ability to move subspecialties and have this sort of lateral mobility in what you can do. So I'll talk in a little bit about my clinical experience and the specialties that I've worked in, but just the ability to change subspecialties in general for me um, is a huge plus to our profession. Like you could do hospital medicine and then after 10 years say, I think I like dermatology. And then after 10 more years, move to plastic surgery. So that kind of ability to move around creates a situation for me where it's impossible to become bored. You can never sort of get into a pigeonhole, realize it's not for you anymore, and then not have the opportunity to do something different. So Kristen, that's unlike say a nursing practitioner, advanced practice person who has to be specifically trained in their area. Isn't that right, I believe? Yeah, my understanding is that more and more nurse practitioners are becoming that way. Um, like acute care NPs typically you know, work in acute care settings and FNPs or family practice trained NPs are more in office settings. I think it used to be less so that, but now in particular, like some hospitals are only credentialing acute care trained NPs to work in the inpatient setting. So it's kind of becoming a little bit more segregated. So uh, again, you know, PAs provide medical care in collaboration with physicians. And in general, our practice continues to expand. Um, mm -hmm. We have legislative teams that are constantly working to increase the scope of what we're able to do. And you know, the difference in what we do now, even compared to 10 years ago, has changed dramatically. It wasn't that long ago that PAs didn't have prescriptive authority, um, that PAs couldn't write scheduled drugs at all, or then later couldn't write scheduled drugs without a sort of delay in being able to do so post-graduation. So again, there's constant advances in our practice. And given kind of what you're able to do, with a relatively low cost of training and a shorter duration of training, um, PA in general can be an excellent option for many people. Now, there are many reasons not to become a PA, um, one of which is that you are the kind of person that needs to be the team lead all the time. If that's your personality, um, PAs are very collaborative and that's probably not the ideal profession for you. If you're looking for an easier path, I would also choose an alternate route um, PA school is extremely stressful and extremely grueling. You have to learn a lot of information in a very short period of time, and you'll have to commit easily, you know, 80 to 100 hours a week into doing so by the time you have all of your coursework, exams, studying, etc. So if you're looking for to pursue PA because you think it may be easier, I would probably look elsewhere as well. One of the things people say a lot that sort of bugs me a bit is that they wanted more work-life balance. Um, in the world of medicine, the subspecialty that you choose really drives your schedule and thus your sort of work-life balance. So, you know, I know PAs that work 80 to 100 hours a week, and I know physicians that work a typical, you know, Monday through Friday, eight to five. And it doesn't necessarily work out that being a PA just creates work-life balance and being a physician doesn't. 
So if that is your mindset, I would kind of reconsider that as well and not factor that in when deciding if you want to become a PA or if you'd rather do something else like go to medical school. So the training for PAs is a four-year undergraduate degree. Um, the prereqs are very similar to medical school. So it's mostly a science degree. Mine was in biology and chemistry or other sciences are common. Then you go on to pursue the master's degree. And more and more commonly, there is an optional residency. And um, this is something that has sort of come up in recent years. It's by no means mandatory for PAs, but it's becoming more common for PAs who want to do something a little subspecialized to pursue a residency program after graduation from PA school. So my background is a BS in biology, a BS in health sciences, a master's in physician assistant studies. And then um, I didn't do a residency, but I did pursue something called a subspecialty certification in hospital medicine. So for PAs, there's something called CAQs, and they're, they're subspecialty sort of certifications that you can obtain after working in a specific field. The requirements are that you've worked for a certain number of hours, and then you take a, an examination similar to your boards really, but um, geared towards whatever subspecialty you're getting the certification in. And then sometimes you, like for example, for hospital medicine, you need documentation from your collaborating physician that you are trained in the certain procedures or things that go along with your field. So these exist in emergency medicine, medicine orthopedics, hospital medicine, et cetera. Um, there's not a specific one for critical care, but it kind of falls within the realm of hospital medicine. So that's why I went ahead and pursued that subspecialty certification. So prior to PA school, uh, you need healthcare experience. This is common in the PA realm. At the time that I applied to my particular program, they had taken healthcare hours of experience off of the admissions criteria, but I was prepared to apply to multiple programs. So I had already went out and received 500 hours of healthcare experience. Um, some programs are requiring shadowing hours uh, for a specific admission requirement, and then some are requiring healthcare experience hours or some combination of the two. I, in particular, worked as a CNA in a memory care unit at a nursing home. It introduced me to how healthcare works, but I really didn't learn a lot about medicine from that job and it wasn't something that I felt like really prepared me well to go on to PA school. Um, many other people do things like scribe in the emergency department or in a doctor's office where you're going to see a lot more medicine in action, particularly in the ER. And I think those types of positions tend to prepare you a little bit better for PA school and the subsequent training if you can get those positions rather than what I did. Most schools don't differentiate on what you have to do in particular to get in, but it, I think things like paramedics or scribes in the ER, those people tend to have a broader base of knowledge going into the program than someone who did something similar to what I did. I wanna to briefly touch on the cost of PA school if you're not familiar. These numbers are for a 27 month program which is now the average program length, and these are tuition only. So this is public resident, public non-resident, and then private tuition. So as you can imagine, when you add in living expenses, the number is obviously much higher than this. This is the tuition only associated. In addition, the average PA student has 26 to 30,000 in undergraduate debt before coming in. So if you're funding this with loans, you can start to get a picture of what your student loan burden may look like after putting yourself through PA school. So of course, this salary is the return on investment, right? There's lots of return on investment. Part of it is that you got the job you wanted and the career that you were hoping for, but financially there has to be a return for you investing all that time and money into a program. As of 2021, the median profession-wide compensation is between 111 and 112,000 annually. 
Starting salaries tend to be lower, of course, 93 to 105 range, and vary widely based on the state that you're in and the subspecialty that you choose. In addition, jobs, of course, have other forms of compensation, including CME money for you to attend conferences and continue your education, paid time off, profit sharing plans, etc. I started my PA career in hospitalist medicine. I worked for a hospitalist group at a different hospital that I'm at now, and I honestly felt like it was the perfect first job. I really got to learn inpatient medicine and just see everything. You just see the bread and butter sort of medical diagnoses over and over and over again, and you learn the basic management of a lot of different things. So for me, that was a great place to start. Although PA programs oftentimes have at least a decent number of the rotations will be inpatient rotation, I still feel like you don't get a good enough opportunity to really learn the whole beast of inpatient medicine in a program. So starting out with a really broad inpatient job when I knew I wanted to continue on and be inpatient for the rest of my career really helped me get a good footing. After that, I did cardiology. I worked for a group um, that had APPs doing mostly inpatient, but then some outpatient work as well. Uh, at that position, I did a little bit of a lot of things, but I mostly did congestive heart failure, and I was a big part of our structural heart disease program. So I saw a lot of valvular heart disease and then took care of the TAVRs, the mitral clips, watchmans, um, and ASD closures, and those kind of patients as well. So that was a really kind of niche part of cardiology that I loved doing and really learned a lot about a very kind of specific thing that not many people get to experience. So Kristen, uh, you know, I trained back in the seventies, I'm an old man. And in those days we had a good stethoscope and we could definitely characterize murmurs. I've now been in the medical school here 20 years watching students and residents train. And it distinctly impresses me that listening to murmurs is kind of a lost art. Uh, how do you feel about that? I agree. I think you should always be able to diagnose a murmur with a stethoscope. Uh, you know, and it's funny, even a few of the cardiologists I worked with would say, well, what's it matter? We get echoes on everybody anyways. But, you know, there's just something about it. And in some situations, it's clinically useful. You know, sometimes you go and see someone in cardiogenic shock, and then you listen to them, and you realize that they have probably severe critical aortic stenosis by exam. And you have this whole thing sort of figured out in your head without getting any other diagnostics. So it's useful, and it's definitely a lost art. It's interesting what changes with the passing of medicine and the passing of the years. The same thing applied to doing an ophthalmoscope, you know, looking at the fundus, the back of the eye on a patient back in the 70s. If I had come out on an exam as part of my complete exam and I had not done that, done a good ophthalmoscopy, you know, I'd have gotten ripped by the attending. <laughs> the other day I had an eye patient put into a room and I, I reached for the ophthalmoscope and it wasn't working. Actually, the head wasn't on the ophthalmoscope. And I go, you know, is, is it firstly putting an eye patient in a room without an eye camera <laughs> was wrong. But the second thing was maybe that I'm the only guy I'll shut up with this. Maybe I'm the only guy in the building still doing ophthalm ophthalmoscopy anymore. You know, there you go. Yeah. Who knows how long that had been broken? Probably a while. Okay. All right. So we'll keep going. And then after that, I am. Um, switched over to critical care. So I love cardiology, um, really loved what I was doing, but as I mentioned, it's a really sort of subspecialized thing that I was in in particular. And I felt like I was losing broad-based knowledge and wanted to kind of get back to seeing and treating a wider variety of diagnoses. And I wanted to learn procedural skills, which was not something that the cardiology group was doing at the time. So I transitioned to critical care and that is what we are going to talk about today. So in general, though, this is what I mean by lateral mobility. Um, I had a lot of opportunities to see a lot of things and work in various areas. And this is hands down my favorite part about being a PA. It's not possible in a lot of other specialties or other healthcare related careers. So um, for me, this was really, really nice. I was able to kind of do a lot of different things. You know, like with any other healthcare profession, there are plenty of other opportunities and things you can do to sort of contribute professionally. 
Um, you can guest lecture at PA programs, precept students. I speak for a pharmaceutical company and you can serve on various committees, state boards, um, legislative things, and generally promote your profession in lots of different ways. So there is more to being a PA than being a clinical PA if you want there to be, but you don't have to. You can be a clinical PA and go to work and go home. That's okay too. All right, so let's talk just a little bit about critical care and kind of what it is that I do day in and day out. I'm calling this a day in the life. It's really a night in the life. Um, as I mentioned, I work full-time nights. My schedule is amazing. I love it. Uh, I work seven 12-hour shifts on and then 14 weeks off, or 14 weeks, I wish, 14 days off. Um, so 8 p.m. to 8 a.m., seven days in a row, and then 14 days off. So why in the world did you pick night shift? Um, multitude of reasons. One, I really wanted that schedule. Um, two, I really like the workflow of nights. Um, I, I rounded, of course, at all previous inpatient jobs, and I like rounding, but I really love the new stuff. Um, I love new admissions, new diagnostics, putting out fires. So the workflow at night is really kind of more in line with what I like to do than the workflow during the day. I remember I, I went home to work in Georgia in my hometown, west of Atlanta. And back in the eighties at four o'clock in the morning, when I was working nights out in this small suburban hospital, I would be the only doctor in the building. <laughs> and so if anything happened, happened, I mm -hmm. had to handle it. I remember the first baby I delivered was a footling breach. You know, I know you know what that is, but for the listeners, it was a, a baby being delivered instead of the head coming out, the foot was coming out. You know? So do you feel like by working at night that you have uh, a chance of being more on your own, so to speak? Yeah, actually it's a whole, it's a whole different beast. Um, there's not a lot of subspecialties in house at night. We really kind of have our service, the internal medicine service, the, General surgery slash orthopedic surgery has someone in house. Cardiology has someone in house, but really no one else is around. So you end up getting to do a lot more because there's a lot fewer subspecialists and things um, kind of meandering around during the night. Of course, during the day, it's you know business as usual, but night is its own beast, that's for sure. All right, so let's keep going. So I arrive at 8 p.m. Um, the way our group is set up, we have a, a physician and APP team that are there until 8 p.m. So from them, we'll get report. They you know, may have accepted patients from outside hospitals throughout the day that are incoming. So they'll tell us all about those patients, what unit they're going to, what to expect. And then they'll let us know if there's anybody who's been decompensating or if they've ordered studies on a patient that maybe they're not back yet and we need to follow up on. So now the shift has started. Um, we, like I mentioned, we don't round. So during the day in a hospital, if you're not familiar, there'll be a list of patients that you'll be assigned to. And you go and see every single patient on your list. You would you know, talk to them, do your physical exam, create the plan for the day, write a note in the chart for the day. And then that would continue every day until the patient gets discharged. Well, on nights, you don't round on anyone. So the workflow is very different. Any new patients that need to be seen, new admissions or new consults is what we will do. When I say we, I'm referencing me and another PA that we work in tandem together as a team. So um, any admission that needs to be come to the hospital that our internal medicine service doesn't feel is appropriate to take, we will get. Those patients are all ICU admissions will come to us. And then sometimes patients that are kind of borderline and may go to what's called a step down unit or a progressive care unit, which is one level below an ICU, we'll take some of those patients as well. So when we go to do an admission, that typically is coming from the ER. So you know, we'll get a call from an outstanding ER doc and they'll say, you know, I have this patient, here's what's going on. I think they need to come in. I think they need to go to the ICU. So we will come down, we will talk to the patient, we'll get a full history on you know, why they're presenting at that time. 
what all of their medical history is, all their surgical history, all their family history, you know, social history, all of that. Examine the patient, review any labs and imaging that have been done already, and then determine next steps. So we'll initiate a plan of care, which may include more diagnostics or treatment modalities, and then do all their admission orders to get them admitted to the hospital. So that's how admissions work. And then a consult would be like, for example, maybe a patient is already admitted to the hospital under the hospital of service, and then they've had a decline in status. So maybe they're hypotensive, their blood pressure is low, they need transferred to an ICU, they may ask us to consult on the patient. So it's the same kind of workflow. You do all the same things for a consult as for an admission. Um, go see and evaluate the patient, create a treatment plan, and then potentially transfer them if they need to be transferred, or they may be able to kind of stay in their current unit. This is the, the bulk of our work actually, is doing new consults and new admissions. Um, most of them come from our ER, but we do accept quite a few patients from outside hospitals. So it may be an, an ER at another hospital completely, and they send the patient over to us because maybe we have nephrology and the hospital that they're at doesn't have that service or something along those lines. Kristen, can you accept the um, admission yourself or do you have to clear it with the team or what do you do? Yeah, we do not have the authority to admit the patient to the hospital. So that has to be under a physician. However, our group, has given all of the advanced practice providers the ability to accept an admission over the phone and list our attending on call as the attending for the admission. They're comfortable with us accepting the patient. So we don't necessarily call them and tell them we accepted the patient. Um, you know, We've all been trained extensively on what's allowed to stay at our hospital and what's not. And essentially our whole practices way of doing business is if the patient can get the care they need at our hospital then we will accept them. So we have sort of blanket authority to accept the patient if we have the resources that the patient needs. Okay. Hey, this will make you smile, Kristen. We've already got 40 questions that have been asked. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> they love what, they love what, you, you won't believe all the questions. It's, it's all the details, you know, how much studying to, to apply, um, Oh, wow. why, uh, you've already answered the one about why you chose nights and the list goes on. Okay. Well, I'm excited about that. So I'm glad, I'm glad people are asking questions. All right. One of the other really big things we do during our shift is see any patients with the decompensation and clinical status. So a lot of hospitals have a system called a rapid response system. At some really big institutions, that system may be made up of like a rapid response nurse and an advanced practice provider. At our hospital, our rapid response team is not that big. It's a rapid response nurse that basically does everything on his or her own. So they will go, they'll get called by the primary nurse. They'll say, okay, my patient's not doing well. Their oxygen needs are going up or they become suddenly confused or they won't wake up. They'll call rapid response and then rapid response will kind of initiate a series of events of calling whoever's taking care of the patient whether it's the internal medicine service or us. But what ends up happening is a lot of times we end up involved um, because the patient's declining. So even if they're admitted to another service, a lot of times we get a call. So those patients, um, we will go and physically see the patient, examine them. We will write a note in the chart, um, not a full consult or admission note like I was talking about earlier, but a note indicating you know, what happened, what diagnostics were done, what the patient's physical exam looks like, and then what we did to intervene. So whatever treatment therapy we started, and then if they had to be transferred to a higher level of care. So maybe they're on a med surge or a floor unit, they have to go to a step down unit, or maybe they're on a step down unit and they have to go to the ICU. So again, this is, a, this is one of the more common things that we do um, during our shift is to kind of put out these fires, so to speak, as I call them, of people that have sudden changes of status wherever they're, they're admitted to the hospital. Um, any patient that is admitted to our service, which is the pulmonary critical care service, we are responsible for taking nursing questions on those patients. So most of the time we have about 100 patients on our service and they, if any question comes up about the patient, whether it's a, a complicated question of, 
you know, they're bleeding, should they continue their anticoagulation or their blood thinner? Or kind of a simple question of, you know, is my patient allowed to eat? There's no diet order. We get a call to our call pager for every single one of those questions. Um, you know, in order to provide an informed answer, you mostly have to get in the chart of every single patient and see what's going on and what happened during the day and why they're on different medications or why there's no diet order and all those things. So this takes, again, a lot of time uh, to answer all of these questions and make sure that we're doing it effectively. Um, Kristen, yeah. am, I, am I reading this? what you said? You have 100 people in the hospital that you're taking care of? Holy cow. I mean, so we don't have to see every one of those patients, of course, but there are over a hundred people on our service. So yeah, we are responsible for anything that comes up with any of those patients overnight. I know that our hospital is at Parkland. Parkland, as I mentioned to you, is the busiest emergency department and one of the largest urban centers in the nation. And I know our hospitalist group will have about 300 on their service. And I just go, my Lord, that's just Uh awful. Yeah, actually, our medicine service will typically have in the 200s, um, and I'll sometimes moonlight for their group, and the they have a person that really all they do most of the night is just answer nursing pages, because there are so many pages. As you can imagine, you know, things come up with over 200 patients and questions being answered, um, but it, it can be a lot of patient pages. Um, we, you know, I'll personally... I've had nights where I have cleared the pager, which I don't even know how many pages the pager holds, probably in the 20s or 30s. And I'll clear that thing two and three times of pages like throughout my shift. And that's in addition to, you know, doing these new things and doing admissions and seeing patients and things. So the pager itself can, this can be its own beast is just answering all the questions. So um, again, we perform procedures as uh, the critical care service, which is one of the main reasons that I really wanted to come to critical care. So the procedures that happen at night are of course different than what happens during the day. The most common things we do at night are place central venous catheters, place arterial lines, endotracheal intubation, and then chest tube placement. Now, um, we are trained to do thoracentesis and paracentesis, but for obvious reasons, we don't run around at night when there's not a lot of people in the hospital doing non-medically necessary procedures. So, you know, those things typically can wait until the day, and so they do. Um, you know, there are obvious reasons why a patient would need a central line or arterial line in the nighttime. You know, maybe they became profoundly hypotensive or had a cardiac arrest, they need vasopressors, through a central line, which are medicines to keep the blood pressure up. And they need an arterial line for blood pressure monitoring or frequent arterial blood gases. Um, Obviously, if the patient needs intubated, they need intubated. Maybe two in the morning or maybe two in the afternoon. We don't get to choose. And then, you know, if someone is on the ventilator and develops a pneumothorax or there's some reason why they need a chest tube now and it can't wait until tomorrow, then we will do that as well. Um, Not all hospitals will credential advanced practice providers to independently do these procedures. This really depends on where you work. Um, I've gone to conferences and met other people who their advanced practice providers do not do intubations without a physician at bedside. They don't do these other lines without a physician at bedside. So it really, it depends on where you are. And I absolutely cannot guarantee that you know, if you become a PA and work in critical care, that you'll be able to sort of independently do these procedures. But where I work, that is our hospital policy. So, you know, once you have X number of proctored or monitored procedures that are then submitted to the credentialing committee and they review them, they will grant privileges for you to do these things independently. Um, Kristen, do you do a fair amount of ultrasound guidance for these procedures? Yeah, so actually almost everything is ultrasound guided. Um, I didn't include a lot of that in this presentation, but we use point of care ultrasound all the time. Um, It's one of our favorite tools at night. I do uh, bedside echoes on almost everyone that's in shock. And then we do all of these procedures ultrasound guided. So um, yes, having, if you go into critical care or emergency medicine or really any acute care setting, having some point of care ultrasound skills will be extremely helpful to you. Um, you know, it's, I've been practicing over 40 years in the ER the full time. And it's interesting how ultrasound has become a tool for 
the related groups. And what I mean by that is our best or, or some of our best ultrasound guided IVs are done by our nurses. Yeah. I mean, they, they get really, really good at it. And I'm pr- actually, I'm pretty humbled about that. <laughs> Could you take 30 seconds and say, if you had a person in shock, why in the world would you pop an ultrasound device on their heart, lungs, and belly? Why, why would you do that real quick? Just real quickly. Yeah. So basically when you're looking at undifferentiated shock or shock that you have no idea why that this is occurring, there are a few sort of things that you can immediately rule out with the ultrasound. Um, one of which is you can rule out a pneumothorax if you ultrasound their lungs. So attention pneumothorax could be an etiology of their shock. You can take a look at their right side of their heart to see if there is evidence of possible pulmonary embolism. You can't see the PE directly, of course, but you can see evidence that it could be there, which could be another cause for them to be in shock. You could see if their um, left ventricular function is extremely poor or basically their heart's barely squeezing. And then that may tell you this could be cardiogenic shock. And then you can look and see, you know, maybe they have free fluid in their abdomen. Well, especially in someone who's maybe anticoagulated or has some other reason to be coagulopathic, maybe they bled into their belly. And the reason they're in shock is because they lost all their blood volume. So you can kind of very quickly rule in or rule out a few common things. Um, especially things that have a different treatment modality that you would want to immediately correct. Like for example, a tension pneumothorax or a massive pulmonary embolism. So the ultrasound is, is really nifty. And especially for a patient that's not really stable enough to transfer for imaging at the moment, it can get you pretty far really at the bedside. One of the questions now of the 50 questions we have <laughs> that was already been asked was what other modalities will change? You know, we mentioned that a while ago with the passing years. And, um, you know, ultrasound still today is a bit like having a guy with bad eyes taking his glasses off. It's a little bit blurry. And I'll bet by the time I'm retired and you've got another decade or two on you that we'll have such clear imaging of the inside of the body. Don't you think? Absolutely. It's really, it is impressive even to see just with the ultrasound, how the ultrasound machine has changed from 10 years ago to now the image quality is substantially better. It's crazy to even think about what it could be, in, like you said, 10 or 20 years from now. I mean, it, it really could be part of your stethoscope, that your stethoscope, you can listen, you can see, uh, and so forth. So it, I think it's going to be really exciting. I'm sorry to keep interrupting. I'm just, no, very, very, I'm very much enjoying this. I didn't tell you, my oldest brother is the chief of pulmonary and critical, or was the chief of pulmonary and critical care at the Medical College of Virginia. So I've had to hear his wow. stories all these years. So. <laughs> That's awesome. Anyway, rock and roll. Keep going. All right. We'll keep rolling here. Okay. Another part of our job is that we respond to all cardiac arrest. Um, although technically in our hospital, the family practice team also is the code team. They respond to codes as well. We do all the post cardiac arrest management. So we are, you know, very much involved with the initial cardiac arrest. So if you hear the code blue, you know, called overhead, uh, that is where we will head. So we will kind of start with directing care during the code and then ideally determine the underlying etiology for the cardiac arrest, ideally achieve ROSC, you know, that's, that's the goal, and then move the patient to the critical care unit to start post-cardiac arrest care. We don't have a ton of cardiac arrests, I feel like. They kind of come in waves, which I'm sure they do in all places you know, you'll have a shift with three codes and then you'll have six shifts without any. So you never know um, when somebody in the hospital will cardiac arrest, but we do respond to all of them. If someone happens to cardiac arrest in the lobby or in the waiting room, that is the realm of the emergency department. We're not involved in that, but anything that's an inpatient code, that is our job to respond to that. Do you you, uh, place ECMO also, Kristen? So we do not actually, we have an ECMO program, but it's a small program. Uh, We don't do any bedside cannulation. Our cardiothoracic surgeons are not comfortable with that. So that is not something that we're able to provide at our hospital. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So let's just do a case study of a potential patient that we could see. So this is a 40 year old overweight female. Her medical history is significant for alcohol abuse, which has been in remission for over five years. 
and she comes to the emergency department complaining of shortness of breath. Her child was recently ill with a febrile illness and then improved. A few days later, she became ill with fever, fatigue, just generally feeling poorly. She is fairly hypoxic when she shows up. Her oxygen saturation is 78% on room air. Her heart rate's 98. Blood pressure is normal. Her respiratory rate's a little bit high. She's breathing a little bit fast and she looks uncomfortable. They do a rapid COVID in the emergency department and it's positive. And she has a chest X-ray that looks like COVID-19. She's placed on six liters nasal cannula oxygen through the nose to keep her oxygen saturation above 90%. They're, she's generally not looking that great. So as they're getting their labs and the rest of their workup going, somebody gets an arterial blood gas. This is her x-ray. That's this ugly. <laughs> uh, this is actually from Radiopedia, but this is, we'll pretend this is her x-ray. That's <laughs> all right. And this, this is her <laughs> arterial blood gas. So I know that you guys are, um, you know, many of you are pre-healthcare, so wouldn't expect you to kind of know what these numbers mean, but I put the normals over here on the right. And the long and the short of this is she is both hypoxic and acutely hypercarbic. And so she is placed on non-invasive positive pressure ventilation or BiPAP in the emergency department. And um, the BiPAP, if you've never seen one, is kind of a full face mask. And there's various ways you can set it up, but it helps with both oxygenation and it can help a little bit with ventilation. So this gal continues to, um, well, at this point we admitted her to the hospital um, and then she sort of continues to decline. Her arterial blood gases actually get worse despite optimizing her BiPAP settings and she becomes increasingly in distress over the next few hours. Um, her respiratory rate increases. It's as high as 45. She increases her oxygen demands and ends up on 100% FiO2, which is the highest level of oxygen you can deliver through that face mask. So we intubate her and she requires mechanical ventilation for COVID-19. Kristen, just to comment <clears throat> for you listeners, this is what has happened to over 500,000 Americans in about a year exactly what she's talking about. This is what happens. This is why vaccines are so important and so on and so on. I'm sure you're going to talk about all that, Kristen. So. Actually, I wasn't, I don't have a lot about COVID in here, um, but I can take a little bit of time now to talk about it. Um, we had, you know, the unfortunate reality is that we all took care of COVID patients, whether we worked in the emergency department, urgent cares, um, hospital medicine, critical care. But of course, you know, the sickest of the sick wind up in the ICU, so they fall to us. Um, it was an extraordinarily challenging year because many of these people that wound up on, you know, mechanical ventilation for prolonged periods of time, and even ECMO for long periods of time, were far younger than the average patient that we'd had in our ICU previously. You know, every year you would see a couple of young influenzas with what's called ARDS, or basically kind of a severe lung reaction that would wind up in this situation where they would be on a ventilator or even on ECMO, but it wasn't that common. Um, and then COVID hit, and then we had all of these really young people in their 40s and 50s with kids who are in our ICU, on the ventilator, on ECMO for weeks, some of them even months. And the hospital has a no visitor policy. So all of these people are here um, on their own with family members who are of course petrified because they um, don't really know what's going on. And even though we're telling them what's going on, having someone tell you like, oh, you know, your family member is sedated, paralyzed, in a rotaprone bed that's flipping them around, you know, several times throughout the day, that doesn't register in the way that seeing your loved one in that condition does. So it was really hard for just a, a, a multitude of reasons. One is we're caring for these people that are profoundly ill, but then two, the families have a really hard time having any sort of grasp of what is going on. Those are really hard things for anyone to understand, especially anyone not in medicine. Hey, and Kristen, so, a, a yeah. question just popped over. 
why is it that our health deteriorated even more with the treatments that you were providing? Welcome to COVID. Uh, yeah. That's the, point. That's the point. I mean, here you are fairly young in your career, minding your own business, taking care of critical care patients. And this thing shows up about a year ago. Could you, could you expand on that just for a moment? Yeah. I mean, we know when it started, I think the, for most of us, it was just this horrible fear of the unknown that we had no idea what to anticipate or what to expect. We're all trying to figure this out as we go. So we don't know, are any, is anything going to help? You know, we tried hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin, and we saw plenty of malignant arrhythmias as a result. We tried early intubation. We intubated everybody that failed nasal cannula, which you would never do. In a normal patient, a regular respiratory failure patient, pre-COVID, you would do all these other things first. You would do the regular nasal cannula through the nose. You would do high flow oxygen through the nose. You would do BiPAP or the face mask, and then you would go ahead and intubate a patient. Well, when COVID started, it's like, how many healthcare workers are going to get sick? How dangerous is it for someone to be on like a high flow oxygen or a face mask that's creating aerosolized respiratory particles? We didn't know. So the early recommendation is we'll intubate all those people. Well, then it's, are we going to run out of ventilators? We don't have enough vents. We don't have enough ICU capable rooms to intubate every person with COVID-19 that fails nasal cannula. And then all of a sudden they say, you know what, they'll do better if you roll them over on their stomach. <laughs> right. And you know, there's just, there were so many things that came out of various treatment modalities. Um, and then I think subsequently, a lot of them have had studies saying they didn't really provide much benefit. So the answer to your question is, this is how it felt for us the whole year. No matter what we did, it felt like there were just some people that were going to get better and turn the corner, and there were just some people that didn't. I can't explain why. There were some 41-year-olds that developed horrific fibrotic lung disease and required transfer for a bilateral lung transplant, and why there were some 91-year-olds that had very minor symptoms, recovered, and went home. Um, I don't know. I really don't think anyone knows. But this is how, this is how it was for us. So, you know, we're, we're all trying our best to take care of patients with this entirely new disease state that none of us have any experience with, you know, even our most experienced intensivists, they don't know, they've never seen COVID-19 before either. So we're and you all know, And, you know, um, I, you know, with, with emphysema that's severe or CHF that's severe, we really kind of pretty much know what to do. And we're pretty dialed into that. Here was a brand new disease. And so much of what we normally would do for these people didn't work. They would just die. And as you say, we didn't, we, we weren't sure which ones would die. And so usual and customary just didn't work. And then the other piece was we didn't have the, 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 the old term in medicine from a century ago was called a specific a specific drug that would treat it. We didn't have a specific. You mentioned hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin, but it wasn't a specific that would knock it out. Right. Go ahead. Yeah, it was, you know, it was a, an adventure to say the least. Um, I learned a lot. You get really, really good at treating refractory hypoxemia in the ICU when every patient has refractory hypoxemia on the ventilator. So, um, you know, it was a, it was a learning experience for all of us, but emotionally it was an experience I'd rather have not gone through. Uh, it was very, very trying to see all of these young people that you felt like you really couldn't do anything for. And then, you know, just the, even people in their eighties to have to watch people pass away in the hospital by themselves while FaceTiming their grandchildren. It's just sad. It's so, sad uh, and it's, it's just messed up. Is so your is. voice shook a little bit there. Uh, how'd you keep from burning out? Oh gosh, I, I burn out. We all burn out, but the, you, we all kind of had to keep working through it. Um, I'm fortunate that I have scheduled blocks of time off. So although we all kind of worked a little bit extra at the beginning of this due to some staffing issues, we, I had scheduled time off and I used my scheduled time off to kind of recover as much as possible. But by the end of the, you know, 84 hour week in the hospital, gosh, I mean, I could just rip all my hair out. You know, that's, 
but there was just no way around it. We all kind of had to do our job. We had to take care of patients and there wasn't, there wasn't really anything that we could do to change what was happening around us. You just had to find your own kind of best way to cope on your downtime that you could. Were you afraid you might get sick? I was afraid that I would get sick, but I think, I mean, I, I felt like I was personally low risk to develop severe illness because I'm otherwise young and healthy, but I was more afraid to go around my parents or to go around my in-laws or, you know, maybe I would have like an asymptomatic carrier state and then potentially infect like my father-in-law has cancer. So those things actually were probably more anxiety provoking for me than me personally becoming ill. Well, I want you to know that uh, there are 720 people listening to you right now that are so stirred by your story. So everybody say, thank you, Kristen, into, uh, into the chat. So Kristen can see the sweet words from all of you. Uh, let us, let's have a few of you pour into chat that, you know, to say thank you for what you've done, Kristen. And I'm sorry to interrupt. This is just a marvelous story. But. No, I, I appreciate it. And I'm sure you've had all of the same experiences that I've had. So, well, I'm an old man in medicine 40 years ago when I was first started working in my hometown in Georgia, uh, skinny guys started showing up very short of breath covered in sores. And we had no idea what it was and they would die. And we had no treatment and we didn't know what it was. Uh, Anthony Fauci, the same Fauci, named it about 1985, HIV, of course. And finally, we began to have treatments for it. But seven, uh, 47 million people have died worldwide of HIV since then. And so we don't have any cures. We don't have a vaccine for that. So uh, the fact we rolled out a vaccine so quickly in this world for COVID is nothing short of amazing. So uh, you just had about 400 thank yous go pouring into chat. Please go ahead, Kristen. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'll be yeah, honestly, the vaccine was incredible. I'm so grateful to be vaccinated and I hope that everybody can get vaccinated as soon as well. Please go ahead. All right, we will keep going here. Um, so the next case is non-COVID, non-COVID medicine. I know it's rare these days that we do do it sometimes. Uh, we uh, lost your audio, Kristen. Oh, there we are. There we are. Hear me? Okay. Kristen, uh, did you say what happened to the lady that in case study one? I didn't say what happened to that lady, but I will tell you that in real life, that um, poor gal actually passed away after a very prolonged ventilator run and needing multiple amputations after developing sort of ischemic digits from prolonged need for vasopressors or medicines to support her blood pressure. Um, so that was actually a horrible case. Um, she, she was not fortunate enough to make it through. So. so any message to America about wearing masks and keeping your distance? Right, right. Absolutely. It's not a joke. You know, we, we had plenty of people that would have probably considered themselves to be low risk that, that passed away or even are still on ECMO right now. So yeah, anything you can do, the simple stuff, you know, wearing a mask and socially, being socially distant is a lot easier than being in the hospital for months. So simple things that we can all kind of do to contribute and try to make this as resolve as quickly as possible, I should say. Take it away. All right. So this is case study two. This is a 55-year-old male. He's a diabetic, hyperlipidemic, hypertensive gentleman. He came into our ER presenting with chest pain. It resolved. And so he was admitted under the internal medicine service with cardiology to consult for further monitoring. At the time, the plan was, you know, we'll check some cardiac biomarkers, maybe get an echocardiogram or an ultrasound of his heart. Think about a stress test versus a possible cath, depending on what these studies show. Two o'clock in the morning, everything great happens at two o'clock in the morning. He <laughs> developed sudden onset, severe chest pain, tells his nurse, this is horrible. It's radiating to his shoulder. He's sweaty. The nurse appropriately calls the rapid response nurse. They come, they get a 12 lead EKG, and this gentleman has a STEMI. So for those of you not familiar with STEMIs, and this particular type of heart attack that is kind of full thickness and requires emergent cath lab. So um, there are specific time windows and all these sort of things we follow. When someone has a STEMI, we all get into gear and get them to the closest cath lab as soon as possible. So if you're not an EKG reader, that's what this shows. So they 
cardiology that's in-house comes to the bedside. They page the interventionalist on call who does cardiac catheterizations and they activate the cath lab. Prior to the patient going down to the cath lab, he develops this rhythm and becomes unresponsive and pulseless. They call the code blue, which is when we learn about this gentleman. So we come, start ACLS, and they had started chest compressions as pads were getting on the gentleman. He's defibrillated successfully, has recurrent monomorphic VT, which is what the last one was. He is defibrillated again. He receives amiodarone, which is an antiarrhythmic medication to prevent further ventricular arrhythmias in this gentleman. He has sustained ROSC, which is return of spontaneous circulation. So in other words, he has a blood pressure, a perfusing rhythm, and a pulse, and he stays that way for a while. Despite all this, he actually kind of wakes up. He's following commands. He's neurologically intact. His blood pressure is stable, so they take him emergently to the cath lab. He has a stent placed, and he walks out of the hospital less than a week later. You know, Kristen, that is an example, again, of the change of technology in 1980, well, in the 19, mid 1970s, when I was in a third year medical student, this guy, <clears throat> he, if he had his MI, he would come in, we would give him hundred percent oxygen, all the morphine he could use. This was pre aspirin, pre nitro. And we would put him in our new CCUs just invented. We would give him dig and Lysix if his lungs <laughs> filled up with fluid and we would pray that he would not die. And, a, and about a third did die. Uh, but, so having a heart attack was a near fatal disease in those days. Today, it, it, it is an acute endovascular emergency. We diagnose an MI and they go to a catheterization lab. It's, it's common knowledge now, but that's something that's come with time just really over the last 20 years. That is so interesting, pre-aspirin, wow. Oh yeah, we didn't know, you know, right. and- Right. Uh, and, and in 1975, the idea that you take a guy, 40 year old fellow with a EKG, like you showed to a cath lab and jam a catheter in his heart. Are you crazy? <laughs> but now, you know, I, I'm the co-chair for the mission lifeline project, which is the heart attack network for North Texas. And we, we measure how quickly we give aspirin in the field by the paramedics transmit the 12 leads, activate the cath lab, and the cath team is standing by. You and your team are standing by. It's impressive. We, we've come a long way. Yeah, Go ahead. Absolutely. Absolutely. So this is a um, sort of favorable cardiac arrest, not all cardiac arrests in this way. Um, but fortunately, this gentleman had a brief cardiac arrest. He had a shockable rhythm and was neurologically intact. So um, as a result, he was able to immediately go to the cardiac cath lab and had an excellent outcome. Okay, so this will be our first Q&A. Elena, take it away. Well, we have several questions. <laughs> we, we have several questions. <laughs> we do. Um, a common question that we have is, uh, what were the main reasons for choosing PA over physicians or nursing? So when I was elected, outside of deciding what I wanted to do for graduate school, I already was most of the way through a biology degree. So that knocked nursing or nurse practitioner out because I would have had to sort of backtrack and redo my whole undergraduate. So I was really kind of debating between medical school and PA school. To be honest, one of the driving factors for me was a counselor in undergrad who told me that the average physician works 70 hours a week and the average PA works 45. I later found out that was not true, <laughs> but that's what I was told at the time. And I really thought, you know, gosh, I'm don't, I want to have work-life balance. I don't want to be in a situation where I have to work all those hours. So I shadowed some PAs, really liked what they did. And I you know, generally a collaborative person, I felt like I enjoyed the team-based approach and that was my path to PA school. It wasn't an entirely accurate path because as I've mentioned, that is absolutely not true. You can have a great work-life balance or a poor work-life balance in whatever profession you choose, <laughs> but that was what I was told at the time. Perfect. And then another question we have is, what is the hardest part of being a PA? Oh, great question. The hardest part of being a PA 
I think probably the most challenging part of our profession is the very broad way in which PAs are utilized. It's kind of unique to our profession, a little bit for nurse practitioners as well, but it, it's not really true for nurses or physicians. Like for example, if you're a nurse in a step down unit or an ICU, your job will look very similar no matter which hospital you go to. Same for a physician. If you're a physician and you work in an emergency department, your job, what you do during the day looks very similar no matter where you work. For PAs, that's absolutely not the case. There are some scenarios in which PAs are used synonymously as scribes, and that's kind of their primary role. And then there are some scenarios in which PAs act entirely autonomously and practice with very minimal collaboration with physicians. That doesn't necessarily always translate to experience or what the specialty is. So I think part of it is local culture, part of it is a group, part of it is the state, but the ability to find a job that sort of matches what you're hoping your scope of practice will be adds an extra layer of complexity for PAs in general to try to find a satisfying job. In addition to all of the things of, you know, what specialty do you want to work in? What hours do you want? What pay? And all of the traditional things people have to navigate on the job hunt. Okay. And then um, earlier you talked about how you could change from one specialty to another. Um, what's the process that you would have to go through to do that? So there's actually very little formal process. Um, if you're board certified, you're board certified and you can switch jobs relatively easily and switch fields relatively easily. Now I will say, if you go into a new field that you're not familiar with, you will need training. So you will need to find a job that is willing to sort of have a training period for what I'm going to call a new APP. Even if you're not new, you know, if you came from hospital medicine and you're going to dermatology, you're effectively new. So you'll need to find somewhere that's willing to train you and to understand that it'll be a learning process for you. But outside of that, there's no formal process that you have to go through to move subspecialties. Okay. And then another question we have is, how long does it take to acquire a CAQ on average? Oh, gosh. I think I had to have been maybe have like two years of hospital experience, and then I had to have certain procedures checked off and then take the exam, and I took maybe six months to get geared up for that. So several years, maybe mm -hmm. two, three years. Okay. Kristen, did you have any idea how much you'd like? I mean, you clearly love what you do. Did, did you have any idea how much you would like that you, that you would like in the future, what you did or doing now when you started out? No, actually, I, I would have never, never thought I would be doing this. I really wanted to work in cardiology from the beginning of PA school. So I would have really never thought of working in critical care, but I do. I actually love it. So. Um, another question we have are, uh, is what are some of the pros and cons in working as a PA in a hospital setting versus a private practice? I would say in general, um, well, I guess I don't want to confuse private practice with outpatient practice to start. Um, for example, I work for a private practice, but I work at a hospital and I don't work for the hospital. So when you work for a large hospital system, as an advanced practice provider, you tend to make um, fairly market average pay. And most of the jobs that have flexibility in salary or maybe larger profit sharing plans and things like that tend to come from private groups. But that's not to say you can't work at a hospital and work for a private group. Okay. And then um, another question we have is, do PA schools want to see shadowing under other professionals like physicians and nursing? Great question. I actually don't know if admissions really looks at that in particular, but I'll tell you that you're probably doing yourself a disservice if you don't shadow a few other people just to see the differences. Like if you're deciding between three different things, you should probably have shadowed multiple people in all three of those healthcare profession so that you know kind of what you're getting into and what you could potentially be missing out on. For sure. Okay. Um, I will go over, a, I'll ask a few more questions. Um, one question is, can a PA specialize in anesthesiology? 
So there are some anesthesiology assistants, I believe, do not quote me on this, they are not PAs. Um, it is a different training program and it is a completely different thing. So I don't think that PAs can really specialize in anesthesia. I believe that's mostly kind of dominated right now by CRNAs and then anesthesiology assistants. Although I will admit, I do not know the nuances of that topic. Okay. And then I'll ask one more question. Um, how often are PAs on call and for how long? Um, that wildly depends on where you work. So I don't take call. Um, outside of my shift, I'm off work. There are plenty of PAs that do take call. And actually a really good resource for that is the AAPA salary report. I know it sounds odd because it's obviously a salary report, but they actually track in the report what various PAs are making for their call shifts. And so there's data in there on what number of PAs take call and on average, how many hours they're on call. I don't remember the numbers offhand, but that information is available in the AAPA salary report. Well, Kristen, we're about to go into part two here. And I want you to know that we, do, we don't have a time limit and you've got about 700 people hanging on every word. So you talk as long as you want and we're going to be here, but uh, we don't want to wear you out. I know you, of course, you, no, wait a minute. You're a night owl. <laughs> I'm actually, I am not a night owl. I'm a morning person. It is very hard for me to switch, but it has been worthwhile for me to learn to switch because I like my job. Well, please rock and roll. We're, we're loving what you're doing. All righty. So we are going to completely kind of transition here from the critical care part and talk a little bit about personal finance, which matters to all of us. So my journey into sort of the personal finance realm started with really my own problems. Um, like I'm sure plenty of you either will be or already are, I had a lot of student loan debt and I had no money and I wasn't really sure what to do. So um, throughout me figuring out how to deal with my own problems, I kind of developed a huge passion for personal finance and now do what I do as a result. So um, I did a little how's it started, how it started, how it's going thing because everyone puts these on social media. Um, so in 2016, I had $161,000 in student loan debt. I had no savings, a mortgage. We had bought a foreclosure that was not fixed up at all. I mean, a lot of help, needed a lot of help. We had no investments and didn't really know how to do any of that. Um, Fast forward to 2021, we have no student loan debt. I actually paid off that $161,000 in student loans in 16 months. We have six months of expenses saved for emergencies like getting furloughed during COVID-19, which happened to a lot of PAs. We have a paid off mortgage, our remodeled house, and we currently invest over 50% of our take-home pay, and we'll have the ability to retire if we want in our mid-40s. So as you can see, we've completely changed our financial trajectory from where we were to where we are now. And the whole process of me learning how to do that has inspired me to create Strive. So Strive Coaching is a company that I founded that promotes financial literacy and financial independence to healthcare professionals. In general, I find that all of our programs, whether NP, physician, PA, all of our programs are really great at teaching us how to do a job and thus how to make money. But they really don't teach us what to do with the money or how to make money work for us so that eventually we don't have to work with our backs and hands and brains and we can retire and have our money sort of working for us instead. So it's a big gap. I think when you combine the lack of financial education with the mountain of student loan debt that a lot of us have, it can be a recipe for disaster. So I basically provide just basic financial education to help people figure out how to navigate their own financial situation, especially in those early years of practice when you have a lot of debt and not have a lot of experience with having a big salary. So how, this is the most common question I get. How did I pay off my $161,000 in student loans in 16 months? 
So I will start by saying that most of my student loans were private and many of them had interest rates of nine, 10 or 11%. So these are like atrocious student loan interest rates, a lot of student loans. It's actually pretty substantially above the national average for a PA graduate to have. And I, again, was just like, I don't know what to do with this. I didn't even really stop to add up how much debt I had accrued until I was a, about graduation time frame. I remember it like it was yesterday. I sat down at my kitchen table. I added it all up and I like almost threw up in my mouth because I really didn't know. I didn't know how much it had accrued to, how much interest had accrued while I was in my program. And I'm just like, this isn't going to work. You know, I had these big dreams and we were going to travel and do all this stuff with this great salary I'd been working so hard to get. And I realized that my student loan payment was going to eat up a lot of it. So before I ever walked in the door of my first job, before I ever got the first paycheck, I decided we we're paying off the student loans as fast as humanly possible. So this is what we did. As I mentioned, I am married, I was married at the time as well. And um, we decided to live off of an extremely small portion of our income. It's actually a little bit less than my, even my husband's income. So every single dollar I made, and then plus some, went to my student loans. Um, we lived in the same small kind of foreclosed house that we had bought. It, we live in a low cost of living area. And so that was a benefit for us, but we held off on doing remodels and all the things until we took care of this debt. I literally drove this, you know, $4,000 Chevy Cobalt that I had had from grad school and I kept driving it. I drove it, you know, while making six figures, I drove it the whole time I was paying off these loans and all the way up until I could pay cash for a better car. We didn't really travel, you know, went to Florida. We kind of kept it within the continental US and we just, we didn't spend a lot of money. I didn't have like fit fun subscriptions and we didn't do a lot of extra stuff like that. Um, we figured out Taco Tuesday was really cheap at, you know, our favorite local Mexican place. And we just, we were very, very frugal. Um, that wasn't enough. You know, you can't pay off $161,000 in 16 months by being frugal alone. So, you know, I also just like worked. Um, people all the time want to know what's the secret sauce. You know, the secret sauce is that I just worked. Um, I got my full-time job. As I mentioned, that was a hospitalist position and I was seven on seven off. So I just filled up my off week. Um, I worked three and four PRN jobs. Some of them were hospitalist medicine. I had an urgent care one and I just organized my entire schedule around how can I make the most money in a really short period of time, to be frank. Um, I picked the PRNs. I ordered them based on which paid the most per hour. And I preference those shifts. It didn't matter if I wanted to do it. It didn't matter if it was my favorite PRN. That's just the one I preferenced. And then I would fill up my schedule, starting with the highest paying ones, to the lowest paying ones. And um, as I'm sure you can kind of work out the math, we paid about $10,000 a month to my student loans for 16 months and they were done. So, you know, looking at this screen, I'm sure you're thinking like, gosh, that sounds miserable. You didn't spend any money and you worked all the time. Well, yes, it, I mean, but yes, it was 16 months, you know, 16 months. Like my PA program was longer than that. And that was, you know, high stress work all the time. Felt like I didn't get a lot of fun. I managed to get through that. So I thought, okay, if I can finish PA school, then I can probably deal with 16 months of this. And I will tell you, it was worth it. And I would do it a thousand million times over for a multitude of reasons. One, financially, of course it's worth it. I had a multi-thousand dollar a month payment that I didn't have anymore. So that alone is worth it. But then on top of that, you know, this taught me a lot about medicine. The, the reality is that you learn by exposure. That's how all of us learn. The more cases that you see, the more experience you get, you know, the more times you've seen something, the more likely you are to recognize it when it comes up the next time. So by living in the hospital, I got more experience. And um, I kind of thought of it as like, this is my little residency. You know, I didn't do a formal residency as a PA. Some PAs do. And a lot of the residents that I know, whether they're medical residents or PA residents or pharmacy residents, 
they work a lot of hours. So I thought, okay, I'm going to do the same thing, but I'm just going to get paid more to do it. So I did, I, you know, I worked, spent a lot of time in the hospital and, um, this, it's how I really dramatically increased my income. Um, my hospitalist job, the seven on seven off ended up being fairly short lived, not by my own accord. Unfortunately, the group, I worked for a staffing company and the entire staffing company lost their contract with the hospital. So as a result, all of our jobs were terminated by proxy. So that's how I ended up in cardiology after only six months of being a PA. When I went to cardiology, that was a Monday through Friday job. Oh, I told you guys before that cardiology was my dream and I wasn't going to pass up this opportunity to work in the, my dream specialty because it was Monday through Friday and it would make moonlighting and doing these extra shifts harder. So at that point in time, you know, I was a decent chunk into my student loans and I had already seen the progress. I knew I was going to continue it. So I just said, all right, well, here we go. I'm going to work Monday through Friday. And I'm still going to figure this out even without an off week. So I did, I worked evenings, I would work Friday night and then I would work like a half day Saturday and then I would have Saturday off and then afternoon. And then I would work Sunday night. Then I would have Sunday day off and then I would go back to work on Monday. Now the nocturnal PRN that I had at the time was a much less busy hospital and I had time, some time to sleep and hours here and there at the, at the hospital in the call room. So it wasn't like I was up hundred percent at that time, but you know, I just made it work. It wasn't fun sleeping in the call room. It wasn't fun spending all those weekends at the hospital, but again, I learned and I got rid of my student loans. So that was my journey, 161,000 in 16 months. It was no joke, but it was a sacrifice that I was willing to make. And I would definitely make again. So after we, I'm sorry, did somebody? Have... Um, uh, no, please go right ahead. Okay. <clears throat> after we kind of got through the student loan portion of things, it was like, okay, well now what? You know, we're used to spending all of this money each month on student loans. We've gotten really used to keeping our expenses relatively low. And that's sort of when my rabbit hole began of, investing and financial independence and how to kind of go about that process. So I don't want to get too into the weeds on all of this today, but I did want to give you guys just a couple of examples of why early investing matters earlier in your career and why little changes and things you may not think about too much at your workplace make a big difference. So we're going to just start by looking at Jack and Jill. Um, Jack and Jill both, we will say they need $2 million to retire at 65. Now, how we've come up with that $2 million is a complicated answer and sort of in depth. So I'll skip over that. But for now, we'll just say that they need $2 million to retire at 65 based on their anticipated expenses in retirement. Now, if $2 million is a number that scares you, don't be alarmed. You'll see that it's very achievable with some early investing and consistency throughout your journey. So Jack and Jill, that's our goal, 2 million at 65 so they can call it quits. Jack starts this whole process at 25. Because Jack is 25 when he starts, he has a lot of time for compound interest to work in his favor. He has to invest $600 a month from the time he's 25 to the time he's 65 and he will have $2 million to retire with. Now this assumes an 8% annual return and I'll come back to that in a minute. For Jill, let's say that Jill, same retirement goal, but she doesn't start until she's 35. Jill maybe messes around a little bit in her 20s. She's having some fun. She's not really worried about retirement or anything like that. And she figures I'll deal with that later on. So she does. She starts at 35. Jill ends up having to invest over $1,400 a month from 35 to 65 to achieve the same end result as Jack. So more than double. Jill has to put aside more than double each month, but Jack does, 
in order to achieve the same goal. Now, what I didn't include in here, and I could have, is the total amount that each of them had to invest over their lifetimes. And as you can imagine, Jax is much less. So Jill has to put double the amount of money each month towards her retirement nest day and invest more money over her working years because less of her portfolio is made up of compound interest and in growth than Jax. So if you're not familiar with how I got this 8% annual return, if you look at the stock market historically over about the last 100 years, the average rate of return is about 10%. And if you adjust for inflation, it's about 8.7% with reinvesting your dividends along the way. So this is a fancy way of saying that although the stock market has variability, the long-term trend is always up. The best visual I've heard of for someone thinking about the stock market is that it's like walking up at the side of a mountain while playing with a yo-yo. So although it's up and down, day to day, up and down, the overall trend is always up. And these average returns are based on very long periods of time. If you look at data on investing duration periods, if you invest for a short period of time, six months, one year, two years, five years, the likelihood of you losing money is higher. As you draw that out to 20, 30 plus years, the likelihood of you losing money goes to almost zero. So for Jack and Jill, these retirement portfolios that you're creating, these are stock market investments that they're using probably tax preference accounts for, maybe it's their employer 401k, maybe it's a Roth IRA, and then they're putting money in, they're investing in the stock market, and then over long periods of time, they're getting returns of somewhere in the 8.7% range over, again, long periods of time. This doesn't mean that the stock market won't go down tomorrow, and it may. If investing for your retirement or for your future is a long-term game. So you want to think of it on those terms, which is why you can safely assume that over long periods of time, you can expect positive returns and compound interest. Let's look at this other example. Now, this is going to be three PAs. For ease of math, they all make $100,000 a year. This is below the national average, guys, so you'll probably make more as a PA. And these folks never get a raise. Again, that's for ease of my calculations. It's very uncommon that you would never get a raise in your working years. So this is Beth, Ann, and Jane, and they each have 401k plans that they use through their employer. Now, a lot of people go in and they'll select a percentage to put into their retirement account sort of willy-nilly. I don't think there's a lot of forethought for a lot of people on, well, what should the percentage be? Now, the most ideal situation is that you've calculated exactly how much money you need to be financially independent. You know exactly what age you want to retire at. You decide which account you're going to use in, in which order. And you know, okay, I need to put this percent of my income into this account and this percent into this account. And you have a whole plan. That's a dream. But if you're not there yet, maybe you're just putting a certain percentage of your income into your 401k like Beth, Ann, and Jane. So Beth decides, I'm just going to put 5%. Why? I don't know. It sounds like a reasonable number. That's what my friend is doing, which is how I've heard some people decide at work. Ann decides to do 7%, and Jane does 9%. Now, remember that when you are putting money into your 401k at work, these are pre-tax dollars. So your income tax is calculated after this is removed. And this is money that you never see. So once you set up your paycheck to where this amount's coming out each month, you never know that it's gone. You'll never miss it because you never had it. Fast forward 30 years later, right? This has been a set it and forget it for these three gals, Beth and Jane. They don't pay much attention to this. They never change it over their working years. They picked it one time and they left it the same. Beth has $700,000 in her 401k. Ann has $980,000. And Jane has $1.2 million. So you see how the difference between a 5% 401k 
contribution and a 9% 401k contribution over 30 years ends up being half a million dollars difference in your retirement investment portfolio. So for a PA or someone making this salary, these small percentages make a huge difference in what your nest egg looks like when it's all said and done. Now, I'm by no means implying that $1.2 million is enough for Jane to retire. That's a conversation for another day. But the point is that you may have underestimated how big of a deal these small percentages make. Now, the other thing you could take away from this is not only the difference that it makes if you change your percentage slightly, but the difference that a small employer match can So if you put 5% in and your employer does 2%, I'm sorry, 4%, that's the same as 9%, right? So if you get an employer match of 100% up to 4%, you end up getting the same total contribution as if you had put the 9% in yourself. So when you're going to interview for a job and they say, we offer a match of 4% or 6% or no, we don't offer a match at all. Well, now you know that that small match can mean hundreds of thousands of dollars over your working years. That's not an exaggeration. So getting an employer contribution to your retirement plan, whether it's in the form of a traditional 401k match or a profit sharing plan can be hugely beneficial to you funding your own retirement and should not be underestimated when you go ahead and start the negotiations and job hunt when you get your career settled and you're in that phase. Okay, so that's all the personal finance stuff I have. It was just a tidbit of kind of getting started on a way you could approach your student loan debt and thinking about investing early on. Um, I'm doing a giveaway on my Instagram right now for the next 24 hours. Any new followers will be entered into a giveaway to win my investing masterclass. So that's about 90 minutes, a little bit plus of information on how to get started investing. It is starts from the very beginning of like, how does investing work and how does interest work? It goes all the way through what the different retirement accounts are, which ones you should use and how to select funds within them. So head on over there um, follow me there and you can be entered to win this investing masterclass for free if you're interested in learning a little bit more about the whole process of investing. In addition, I have a lot of resources on my website. Um, I have a lot of information about student loans, public student loan forgiveness, how to manage private versus federal loans, how to get started budgeting, how to get started investing and all of those things. So there's a blog post, podcast, and a whole bunch of other things you can dive into if you want to learn a little bit more about personal finance. Um, here's my contact information. If you have a question you can think of or something I can help you with, feel free to reach out either as a direct message or um, by email. I am happy to help either way. Kristen, a couple of questions have come up about is, are your recommendations only for the United States? So I do, I will say I'm most familiar with retirement accounts and how that works in the United States. There are pretty, especially in like Canada, there are very comparable accounts that work almost the exact same way. But most of the stuff that I reference are the names of these things uh, that are set up for US based people. Well, this is so important because you're talking to, a you know, 700 pre health students, all of whom are going to have to invest in some way in their future. And debt is going to very commonly follow that. And, and knowing how to manage that as a young person is not genetically acquired. There's nothing that says that you necessarily know how to do this. We had a previous talk on finance and medicine by Dr. Um, Angela Gardner uh, earlier in the virtual shadowing sessions. <laughs> And she gave us some really great advice about how not to be wasteful. This will make you smile. She said, don't get married. But if you do get married, do not get divorced. <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> well, wonderful. Elena, what's next? Do we move into questions from here? Uh, yes. So we do have some questions. Um, I first just want to say how much I appreciate your talk, especially the finance. 
I mean, a lot of people, we don't realize that it starts at such a young age. So I'm sure this has been really useful for many students. Um, one question we have is, what did it mean about work-life balance? Or what did you mean about work-life balance as a reason to not be a PA? So I want to clarify that um, I had been kind of told that PAs have great work-life balance automatically, and that's as opposed to physicians who have poor work-life balance automatically. That is not true. Okay. There are PAs that, you know, work part-time two or three days a week because they want to be home with their family. And then there are PAs that work hundred hours a week. And the same is true of physicians. So I just want to encourage you not to choose the profession based entirely on what you think the work-life balance will be, because it can be really variable depending on where you work and what subspecialty that you're in. Okay. And then another question we have is, what advice would you have for a non-traditional pre-professional school candidate who currently has a lucrative career option? That's tough. Um, so I actually get asked this a lot. It, like, is it worth it for me to go back to school? And the answer is twofold. Okay, there's the financial answer. And then there's the life answer. So if you're completely unfulfilled, and you think that this would be the career that you know, will get you getting up in the morning feeling like you're doing meaningful work, that's a separate conversation. But if you're just thinking about the money, you can actually run the numbers. So you can say, okay, PA school tossed me this much per year right? Tuition and expenses. And then you can say that's part of the cost. Then I have my missed income, right? Because I could have been doing whatever I'm already doing. That's lucrative for those years when I'm in school. And then you can add all that together as sort of your cost or your opportunity cost, so to speak, of going to PA school. And then you can calculate how many years will I have to work as a PA to earn back that income or the missed income of me being in the program. Obviously, the number varies depending on if you go to a private institution or a public program and you're a resident. But for some people that are making outstanding money, it may be a situation where they're working as a PA for 20 years before they ever earn back the investment. Now, if, again, this is meaningful work for you, this is you fulfilling your life's goals, that's not to say you shouldn't do it. But I think it is important for you to understand the whole financial picture as you're making your decision. Okay. And then another question we have is, um, did you apply for scholarships and would you recommend applying? Great question. I did not. And I would absolutely go back in time and redo that if I could. I had this sort of odd limiting belief that scholarships didn't exist for graduate students. I don't really know why I thought that or where I learned that, um, but it's not true. There are plenty of scholarships available, and I should have spent a substantial amount of time looking for that. Um, even if you get, you know, a $2,000 scholarship, and it takes you two hours to go and apply and write the small essay required, you just made $1,000 an hour for your efforts. So I did not spend um, adequate time looking for scholarships, and I strongly recommend that if you're pursuing any sort of education at all, period, that you exhaust all efforts in finding scholarships. Not only is it money you don't have to take out in loans, but then you don't have to accrue interest on that money either. So um, absolutely take advantage of this. There are millions of dollars in scholarships that go unused every year. And these are for graduate students too. So you spend a lot of time, specifically like if you can set aside a certain amount of hours per week to look for scholarships even and make sure that this is something that's a routine for you. Like, you know, every Sunday afternoon I apply to five scholarships, and then those small ones will add up. Okay, that's good to know. Um, another question we have is, does critical care require you to think more in depth, in depth and come up with more comprehensive care plans for patients in contrast to specialties like emergency medicine where you have to make more quick decisions? So I think that there are a lot of quick decisions in both. But the thing I would say is if you're really good at your job, no matter what type of medicine you work in, you should be critically thinking about every single patient. Because, you know, whether you're in dermatology, cardiology, GI, there is always a differential diagnosis. There is always rare manifestations of diseases and you should be considering everything and every patient that you see. Kristen, you know, uh, I, I, I think that there are a lot of things that keep a, 
keep a, a healthcare person coming back, first and foremost, it's absolutely the people you take care of and the people you work with. Uh, I think there's no question. Patients help refill our well, if you will. I also think that medicine is incredibly intellectually stimulating and difficult. It changes all the time. I mean, just look at COVID for one thing. Um, do you find medicine and critical care intellectually stimulating and challenging? And subset question, do you read all the time? <laughs> Absolutely. So I think that's my favorite part of critical care, but really just medicine in general. Um, there is, you always see something new, you know, it's never always the same things. And so I do spend a ton of time reading. I spend a ton of time on up to date because as you said before, no one knows everything. And even like, you know, the more you learn, the more you just realize that you don't know. So, um, yeah, I spend a ton of time reading and it's probably still not enough. So learning all the time. So would you say then that a commitment to a career in medicine, whatever it is, if you're going to be involved in patient care and having to figure things out, that it's going to be a lifetime of study, would you Absolutely. say? Absolutely. I really think that in order for you to be successful, no matter which profession you choose, if you're a PA, NP, physician, pharmacist, you have to be committed to learning your entire career. Medicine changes so quickly. And honestly, even if you're extremely subspecialized and you know a very like niche amount of information, that will change. So you have to be willing to be reading, reading studies, um, finding out what's coming out, because really genuinely there is something new all of the time. And on the flip side, do you find medicine humbling? I mean, how often in critical care where you get the sickest of the sick people in the world, do you look at something and say, what in the hell is this? I have yeah. no, I, I have no idea what I'm looking yeah. at. Absolutely. Absolutely. Or you see some, some odd thing and you're like, I genuinely, I just don't know what this is. And you know, it ends up being a really cool case and somebody much smarter than me figures it out, but it's fun. I mean, the whole process of just seeing it all and seeing the process and the differentials and mm -hmm. watching kind of the way diagnostics work and how different people present it's always a learning experience and it's my favorite part of my job. Elena, one or two more, maybe. Okay. Um, what are your biggest tips for applicants applying to PA school this cycle? So, um, you know, I think it really varies based on school. Uh, I'm most familiar with Butler because I've been affiliated with that university and that's where I went to PA school, but at least for them, the fundamentals have to be there. You have to be academically intact. You know, you have to have scores on exams that will show them that you're able to do the just straight academic work of PA school. But just as important as that, they're looking for people that they're going to be comfortable spending a substantial amount of time with. So, you know, when you enter a PA program, they're relatively small and the people that you're around and the faculty that you're around are going to be spending a tremendous amount of time with you. So they want someone that's going to be professional, that's going to be a team player, that's going to be able to be in a stressful situation, aka the whole entire PA program, and treat other people well, maintain, you know, a polite demeanor and all of those things that go along with just being a decent human being. So I think it's a combination of presenting yourself as a well-rounded human that is going to be able to be a part of a team in addition to someone who can just do the straight academics. Okay. And then uh, the last question I'll, I'll ask is, you work 12 hours, uh, 12 hour shifts for seven days straight, and then you have two weeks off. Yes. So that's about 84 hours of work a week. My question is, are you getting any overtime pay with the work schedule or, or are your, um, your salary? I'm not, I'm salaried. I am a 1.0 FTE salary. And honestly, I feel very grateful that I'm a 1.0 FTE salary because I know a lot of people that work nights that work seven on, seven off. So for me to have seven on, 14 off and be a 1.0 FTE salary makes me feel very blessed. Um, I do still work a little bit extra sometimes. Like I mentioned, I'm in light sometimes for the internal medicine service where I'll pick up some shifts for our service. And those are paid hourly in addition to my salary. But for my regular week, I am a 1.0 FTE and I am a salary. Okay. Well, Dr. Elena um, and Kristen, 
Kristen Burton, what a wonderful talk tonight. My goodness, that was just terrific. Um, you're, it was just so good to hear how much you love what you do and how immersed you are, how you've dealt with this terrible epidemic, its own effect on you as a person and as a clinician. Uh, we love the finance stuff. It's such good advice. Thank you for sharing that with us. And I deeply hope that some of our students will reach out to you. Kristen, we, this is our 39th lecture. Typically about 5,000 students will watch it, uh, roughly 1,000 online initially, and then about 5,000 altogether. Each one of those healthcare providers ultimately in their career will see 100,000 patients. 5,000 times 100,000 is a half a billion. Tonight, you have touched a half a billion lives by your kindness and your generosity in being with us. I hope you see the thank yous pouring into chat right now but because we're so very deeply grateful. Uh, I wanna remind everybody about the virtual clinical observation program, vcop.ws, which will allow you the opportunity to be uh, involved directly in virtual clinical observation, vcop.ws. So Kristen, thank you so much again. And I hope that the thank yous that you see pouring into chat give you just a tiny idea of how very grateful we are. So Elena, you wanna wrap it up? Uh, yes, could, uh, could you go to the next slide, please? Sure. Uh, one more, yes. So here's the Questspace info for the quiz. Um, you see the PIN number and the password is Kristen with no capital letters. Uh, this will be due uh, next Tuesday, at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. All right, everyone. Well, thank you for coming tonight. It's such a pleasure to have to be able to get together with you again. Finally, the weather is cooperating. We'll be back next week with a wonderful session. Uh, just one of the many series that Kristen has been a great example of tonight. We thank you for coming, all 46,000 of you in 28 nations at 951 universities worldwide. We appreciate you. And this is uh, we're all we're all in this together. And we're here to help. So on behalf of the whole virtual shadowing team and uh, Kristen, we want to say thank you so much. Have a great evening.